to art and in the second half of the session we will look at the essay questions and suggest some pathways to deal with them. Um, so that's, that's the general uh, direction I hope to, to take today. I'll just tell you a few words about myself because you don't know me. So as I said my name is Daniel Rubinstein. I am um, I'm uh, the head of photography in London South Bank University. I'm running the BA and MA in photography there. And I am also the editor of an academic journal that's called Philosophy of Photography. I write on questions to do with new media photography, aesthetics. Uh, and I know Johnny for the last 10 years. I've been going to her classes, you know, and I remember vividly how these first few years sitting in our classes, I was, uh, what the heck, what? <laughs> but because I did find a way around that, and I found a way to make it work for me, and I found a way also to use it in my own practice, both as a uh, teacher, as an artist, as a writer, I also want, with this session, to give you some sense of how to deal with the whole, with this whole thing of the theory that Johnny offers. Because I think there is something really unique and quite exciting on offer here. But like many highly enjoyable things, like classical music, horse riding, various other things, they require patience and perseverance. They don't just come to you like a chocolate cake. You can enjoy, enjoy them from the first bite. They you need to put in quite a lot before you start getting something out. But what you start getting out, you cannot get in a cake shop. So for that reason, I hope today, while looking at Adorno through that, to also kind of try to discuss well, how you basically unpack a difficult text, how you approach difficult, um, how do you deal with the question of difficulty um, in your own practice as well. And more, even more importantly, how do you make pragmatic connections between the questions raised in a text, the question raised by an author, and your work? Because in the end of the day, what we do here has a very pragmatic edge to it. If it was not useful for practice, if it was not useful for sculpture, a painting, a film, a poem, a novel, it wouldn't be much point doing it. This is not a scholastic academic exercise. We could just sit down, sit and do Sudoku. But there is something about these texts that actually help one to get to grips with practice. And I think probably most of you here are practicing artists. Is that kind of an assumption we can, uh, we can start with? Well, that's great. Um, I used to be a practicing artist, and then I realized I like art too much to actually do it myself. And, um, but now I'm sorry, I write, so my practice now is writing. So um, I, want to, um, I wanted to 
start this conversation, I will just move to the other side so you can. Uh, I want to start this conversation by um, saying a few words about Adorno and why specifically Adorno is a really useful way into this question of how do you connect your own practice and theory. And there are basically three key books that I will be drawing on uh, tentatively throughout this session. Uh, the big negative dialectics. Now if you look on Amazon, there are two covers for this book. One is this nice golden one. The other is black and white with a sort of dying flower in a vase. And I find it the most depressing cover ever. I could never get myself to, to buy that. So I recommend the, the, the bright yellow one because it's, it's negative enough as it is. You don't need a dying flower to tell you what is it about. Um, the other one is the minima moralia, which is exactly the opposite of negative dialectics. Uh, while it's dealing with the same issues, negative dialectics is heavy, difficult, hard to penetrate. Minima moralia is like a collection of short, astute observations. You could imagine them being published, let's say, in the Observer as like a little column. They are ready to be kind of consumed on the go, and you can just dip in, read a paragraph, and get something out of it. So that's, that's a really lovely book to keep by the bedside table. The title is Minima Moralia. Um, once these things are uh, working, I can also show you the covers. Finally, the crowning achievement, Aesthetic Theory. It's the book he failed to finish. He died before finishing it. I will talk about that a little bit. Um, Aesthetic theory is really a book that you want to have if you ever get into conversations about art. Is it good art? Is it bad art? If you want to be able to put your opponents down, you know, like a ten paces, just kill them, that is the book to have. Because Adorno, because Adorno there explains, it's not a question of opinion, oh, I like it, but, but I like it, but I think it's art. No. He can show you that clear ways to determine whether something you see in front of you is good or not. So for that reason, it's a wonderful book. It's written so, it's so intense. Sometimes when reading it, after like a few lines, I have to put it down and take a breath of air because it's just, it just saturated. And again, it's not a book you need to read from cover to cover. Almost any paragraph will provide you some really interesting idea to connect to a, something you're working on, something you're writing. He is, Adorno is fantastic, for instance, if you, are, uh, if you need to write artist statements or any kind of writing about your own art. I don't know about you, but in the, in the place where I work, every academic who also does, does practice needs to write this kind of 300 word, very succinct, introductions, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? Uh, but and I, that, that, that can be really, really difficult. We even run workshops, you know, sort of how, how to write these statements. Adorno really helps, because he helps to distinguish between opinions and positions and things that actually stick, things that actually make sense, not because they make sense for you, but they really make sense in a bigger context. So, um, so I'm just... Um, indicating what we're going to, uh, to do. And, and finally, a book I picked up just recently, but I really enjoyed it, so I wanted to show it. It's um, an introduction to Adorno, published by Routledge. Just came out now, 2012. Um, Brian O'Connor, Adorno. You can read it in one afternoon. Generally, you have to be wary of these kind of introductions to the thought of someone. Generally, I think if you have two hours to read something like that, it's better to read the original text, because at least you hear the voice of the author. But after you did read, hear the voice of the author, it might be very useful to go and look at, at uh, 
that. So for instance, some of the questions um, you got for your essays uh, that deal with issues of around, let's say, subjectivity, uh, negation, uh, aesthetics, that could be um, quite useful. So, okay, now, what do you think it will happen? Well, yeah. So can we just have just that? And I think have a minute. The actual module that controls how it all works that as well now. Oh, but but that is the work. Uh, that that's more right. so it's <coughs> okay. And do you think we could turn the screen around? Yep. So then the students could see the screen? Or is that <laughs> no the problem is it didn't work. Right. So that didn't work, but let <laughs> um, bypass it through. Luckily, I did not. I, I did not expect to rely too heavily on technologies. The only thing I really wanted to show you were a few images by Ron Athey as a way of talking about um, art in, in this adorable sense. Anyone here heard of Ron Ron Athey? You heard. You know his work. Did you see any of his performances? Yeah? So I want to show a few still images. I mean, uh, we might even be able to uh, look at them on the iPad later on. But, um, okay, so we also, I also cannot draw anything. But, uh, okay, so let me just somehow set the scene for a discussion about the drama. And as I said, I bring it to you with, with a clear knowledge that it will be useful for what you want to do. Um, Adorno is probably the most important or the most interesting person who wrote about art in the modern sense of art, not in the sense of Turner or Mozart. Also, he also wrote about Mozart. But in the sense of modern or postmodern art. In a sense, Adorno really sits between modernism and postmodernism. To put his um, um, historical period somehow accurately, you need to think about the Second World War. He, wa he was born, I think, in the very beginning of the 20th century, and he died in 68 or, or 69. I, I listened to some of the lectures Joanie gave you, and I think she mentioned once, Adorno, how uh, the, the students uh, kind of rebelled in his classroom and then he had a heart attack and died. So I'm going to expand that a little bit because I think this is really interesting. But, but so this is an impor important thing to bear in mind because you could almost say that Adorno was the person of his writing really brought about the age of postmodernity. He critiqued modernity uh, and rationality and allowed for a generation of young people to say, well, something is deeply wrong with the university, something is deeply wrong with academia, something is deeply wrong with the society, and we want to change all that. And the, re the revolutions of 1968, in a sense, were started through his writing. So there is a kind of by the irony that that's also what killed him. Uh, but just, just so you have a kind of a, a, a notion where he sits, he, uh, he, is, he didn't quite get to the promised land. He didn't quite become a postmodern writer in the same way that, let's say, Lyotard, Jean-Francois Lyotard, or Derrida, or Deleuze, or Bottery became. But he made it possible for them. So he is one generation before. Um, so his period is the period of the first half of the 20th century, and the most significant event of his life is the, sec the Second World War and the Nazi Germany and the extermination of Jews. He was not a Jew himself. It's slightly confusing, but uh, his, um, his father was, uh, I think, half Jewish. His mother wasn't. Uh, he never considered himself a Jew, but there was, of course, this kind of connection. And, um, and the events of <coughs> the war um, are the real mark of his life. 
and sometimes his philosophy is referred to as the melancholy science. You know, so there is kind of melancholia when you read Adorno, you should hear sort of violins or cellos in the background. It's all very dark, it's very, very sad, it's all guilt driven because he lived through this terrible period, you know, he saw the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he saw the photographs from the concentration camps, you know, from um, from Baden-Baden, from uh, Treblinka, from Auschwitz, uh, he felt survivor's guilt. And I think one of the questions is precisely about that, we will come to that later on. So that's kind of the intellectual, or maybe the historical environment from which you need to start teasing out uh, this character. However, I want to start from a different point, and that is there is an exhibition right now as we speak in Rotterdam. If, if anyone's going to the Netherlands in the near future, you can come to me later and I will give you the details. There is, con there is this exhibition in Rotterdam. I've forgotten the name of the artist. Uh, she's a, um, from Berlin, um, a German uh, artist. And it's called Adorno Grey. It's a cinematic, it's a filmic installation. And um, in this film, you see um, kind of restorers, uh, people who restore artworks, chipping away <laughs> the sort of uh, a wall in a Frankfurt classroom, like this more or less classroom, where Adorno used to, cheat, to teach. And they chip away at the paint. Because the legend has it that Adorno required the room to be painted gray, everything to be painted gray, so the students can really concentrate on his ideas. Yeah? Now that gives you the measure of the man. No? <laughs> Just imagine going, let's say, to the administration here and saying that I want this room painted gray for the next session, so the students, you know, will have this neutral background. But of course it also raises very interesting questions. Why gray? You know, what, what kind of color is there? We will get into it in a second. But the point, and another point, another story that is told in, by this film is how during the student riots of 1968, when, um, as I said, the riots were, to some extent, provoked or maybe intellectually created by Adorno's early writing, by the book he wrote with uh, Hochheimer, Dialectic of Enlightenment. It was one of the early works, and they wrote it in the 40s during the Second World War when they both were in exile in the USA. And in this book, they showed how uh, modern European culture uh, contains within, within it seeds of its own destruction, and how the fascism that they witnessed flowering around Europe really comes out of the ideas that developed during the Renaissance and during the Age of Enlightenment. That's why it's called the Dialectic of Enlightenment. It shows that if you want the dark side of Enlightenment, the, um, the irrationality that con is concealed within the rational framework of Enlightenment. So this book has a huge influence on the people who went to the streets in the 1968 demonstrations and demanded change and basically said, look, our institutions are fascist, even though the war was, is long gone. But our schools, our hospitals, our uh, universities, all based on fascist principles. What we are taught in, in, in classrooms is a fascist uh, ideology and, and that's what needs to be changed. That's what the students were saying. There was even a kind of uh, a saying among the students uh, that uh, they were saying that oh, I cannot join the revolution because I have uh, Adorno's lecture. Because he was considered really one of these um, heroes of the movement. However, when the students in his university in Frankfurt occupied the building, he called the police to kick them out. For him, it was like fascism. He did not believe in revolution. For Adorno, revolutions were delusional. They were not aware of their own motives. They would always end up in some kind of form of oppression. He did not believe in that that is the way. So when the students occupied the building, he called the police. And 
few months later as a kind of revenge. During one of his lectures, probably in this gray room, three female <coughs> students approached him. A little bit like, you, the, the, you remember the pussy riot uh, thing that just happened recently? <laughs> approached him, uh, bared their breasts at him, and then showered him with petals of roses. That was their proper action. He was horrified. He ran out of the classroom. And since then, he never taught again. He then just retired from teaching to concentrate on writing the book, The Aesthetic Theory. The irony of it all is that Aesthetic Theory is precisely a book about the way art and society interact. And somehow, this is the, that's the thing. That, that is kind of way to get into the whole story of Adorno. But just to finish the story, he later on, uh, as Johnny already told you, uh, quite soon after that, that um, action, um, he died. He had a heart attack and died. So here you have it. And I think it's just uh, such an amazing uh, trajectory to be the one who sets this whole movement up and then not being able to recognize the agency of this action, not being, not being able to see that actually this action of these three women is that direct practice that he developed in his own writing. When it was uh, pointed at him, he couldn't take it <coughs> and, uh, and collapsed. He collapsed at the face of the inability to acknowledge the thing that he was fighting for uh, throughout his philosophical career. And I think, for me, this is interesting because I think Adorno, well, that, that's my own way of getting to that. And you free completely to disagree with that. I'm not even sure Johnny would agree with that. But I think, ultimately, Adorno's project fails and succeeds in equal measure. And you can kind of see it in this story. It succeeds to the extent that it allowed these women to do a political action which was non-violent, which is all about joy and pleasure, you know, just, you know, uh, exposing themselves and showering someone with, with petals, you know. Clearly, it's not a violent, action and yet it is deeply it's powerful and political and kind of shifting something so it's his own thinking that that made that possible but at the same time there was something missing in his thinking to allow him to also embrace that and it is possible that every thinker maybe every person at some point comes against the limits of their own idea. So that brings me to a kind of observation about the way to approach Adorno, but also anyone else, for that matter, that we're going to um, read here. The, the thing with philosophy is that it's completely pointless to read someone uh, in order to argue with them. <coughs> it's going to be a, a complete waste of time to, for instance, read Adorno and say, well, I, don't, I disagree with that, I agree with that. That's not why people write philosophy. They don't write for you to agree or disagree. Philosophy is written, and I think it's also true probably about art to some extent, in response to problems. So the challenge in meeting Adorno is not being convinced by his Words. It's also not uh, finding a way of arguing. Complete waste of time. The challenge is to understand what he writes in response to. What is the problem that he identified that causes him to write? If there was no problem, there would be no need to do philosophy. There are better ways probably to spend one's life. So you end up doing philosophy 
because something is hurting or there is a hole that you need to fill somehow. Some things they don't put things don't quite fit together and the way they don't fit is just really annoying you. It keeps squeaking and you see that it doesn't make sense and people carry on as if it does and they just drive you crazy. And then you go and you write your book and you make a painting and you make a sculpture or you, you make a movie because something is really annoying you. So as readers or viewers, our task is to identify what is this thing that is annoying. And having said that, I mean, the second step of that move is also to realize that each time a philosopher identifies a problem or a hole in the dike like this, um, anyway, like this Dutch child, you know, the, the Dutch boy who sticks his finger in the dike to stop the city from flooding. You know, that's what philosophers do. Uh, but every time you do something like that, you also cause another thing to happen. Another hole opens. So our task with Adorno is on one hand to see what he is responding to. Why he is choosing to deal with these particular questions. What is nagging him. And on the other hand, to also see what problems his move creates, what doors close, what avenues become unavailable, where his move, how far his move can take us, and where it stops. So that, to my mind, is an active and productive way of engaging with the philosophical text. So just to repeat, not to agree or disagree, not to memorize the argument, to be able to sort of uh, parrot it, but to understand what is it in response to. And if you understand what is the problem, then you can write essays about it. Because then you don't need to summarize Adorno's argument, but all you do is explain what was the nagging problem. And generally, great philosophers respond to problems they identify in other great philosophers. And it is very true about Adorno. <coughs> and the great philosopher is responding to, do you know who it is? Is Hegel. Did you come across Hegel before? Yeah? And did you read any Hegel? Did you, did you read the introduction, the, the preface to phenomenology? Yeah? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> no, <laughs> it is not very enjoyable, it is tough. Uh, but Hegel is a great philosopher, and it's a relief that we now have other great philosophers, so we don't need to read Hegel all the time, because luckily there are much more enjoyable texts to read. But uh, for Adorno, Hegel is the problem. And at the same time, I mean, Hegel is a problem because it is impossible not to love Hegel. It is impossible not to be completely blown by over by the power of his system. Because as Jerry probably explained to you, it's a system that, that contains everything within it. Nothing escapes. It explains everything. So for Adorno, that is incredible temptation, but it is also the problem, because if nothing escapes, then how real it is. I mean, we know that in life there's no such thing that nothing escapes. You know, you know this thing doesn't work. No, so something clearly escapes. Something clearly breaks down. Things stop working. You know, mal malfunctioning. There is noise. There is stutter. There is, you know, just kind of hubris, you know? And that is not part of any system. It just, you know, the leaves behind the window, the, 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 the noise when you speak to someone on the phone, the uh, static when you listen to the radio. These things are not part of any system, but they're still there. And they don't seem to be captured by Hegel. 
Now, for Adorno, in a very simple sense, that is the problem. Because that also has, of course, political implications. Yeah? So just to briefly um, point the, the political difficulty, in the Hegelian system, and I'm probably repeating now things that um, Johnny already spoke about, so um, <coughs> apologies if, I've, um, if you heard it all before. But in the classic dialectical system, and you're familiar with the dialectical term, yeah? Um, you have the, the thing, like, you know, uh, black, and you have white. And you put them together, and you have black and white. And here you have black and white photography. I told you I, I come from photography background, so my examples tend to be of that kind. OK, great. So you have, you have everything. However, you see where I'm going with it. Photographs are not black and white. They have grays. Maybe that's why his room was painted gray, to illustrate to the students that the Hegelian dialectical move that puts the black and the white together and claiming this is the whole never captures the grays. Yeah? Uh, maybe the, the gray has, um, has a different meaning. But we're going to get into that when we look at the questions in much greater detail. I just wanted to say how the, the, the way to understand Adorno is to see that his response is um, to the Hegelian dialect. But it's also important to bear in mind that um, Adorno sees the system, the Hegelian system, as a problem. But his solution, his solution to the problem is an anti-system which is not exactly, which is not the same as no system at all. Somehow, anti-system still has a kind of relationship to the system. And that's what we, is that working on? Yeah, it was visualized. Thank you very much. That's, that's perfect. That's all I need. And that's what we will try to get into with the help of a, of a couple of um, quotations. So that's uh, minima moralia. And the other two are uh, well, um, easy to, to grasp. And that's the, the new Brian O'Connor's introduction to the thought of Adorno. I just wanted to read with you maybe just one sentence to give you a taste of the man. The good thing about Adorno, good or bad, I don't know, it depends on, on, on your uh, preference, is that he's very laconic and almost, he almost writes in kind of aphorisms. So almost every sentence is a complete argument. Sometimes one sentence is enough. So here, let's take this one sentence here. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't do a manicure. Um, <laughs> um, I hate this thing. Uh, so, uh, what is um, is it in focus or the problem? Um, okay, 
Okay, can you read that? Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to draw your attention to this one little sentence. And which? Oh, well, it's, it's from a from a from a little, from a little uh, passage that's called Do Not Knock. That starts from Technology is making gestures precise and brutal, and with them, men. That's adorable for you. You can just feel it sort of, you know, shitting out this little kind of morsels of wisdom, you know. <laughs> it expels from movements all hesitation, deliberation, civility. Right. So now this sentence, which I think probably one of the greatest sentences ever written by a philosopher. And which driver is not tempted merely by the power of his engine to wipe out the vermin of the street? pedestrians, children, and cyclists. <laughs> yeah, it's good, no? <laughs> And it's so astute, don't you think? I mean, what do you think he is getting at in this sentence? That's a question. What do you think? So the, the, the thing that we all have, that, you know, that it, it's road rage, isn't it? That's like that thing that we... When you're driving on the motorway, you must, sometimes you just want to do that, you know, but you're never going to do it, but there's that possibility that you might. It's a kind of road rage on a really tiny scale. He's not yeah. talking about, he just says how the power of the machine you operate puts you in a certain relationship of power. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know this, because for my sins, I drive in London. And, you know, when I walk on the street as a pedestrian, the... The, the cyclists are, you know, they're just like, you know, like leaves that fall of these trees, you know. I really wouldn't care about them because I just walk on the pavement. But I drive, and they just get in the way, you know. And, and you know, sometimes I cycle as well. So, but, so, so it's even more peculiar because, of course, when you cycle, then it's kind of, you are, you are again in a different place. But, you know, you sort of, you have this movement, you have this force, you know, and force demands respect, that you have this authority because you have this half a ton of metal between your hands. And what he's saying here, the way I see it, and again, you, you're free to disagree, is that the technology itself, the automobile, as a piece of technology, it already making you a little bit of a fascist. You already become a little bit more aggressive. You become a little bit more dominant, a little bit more masculine, just because you have this machine. Yeah? Now, you could almost draw the whole story of fascism out of this one sentence, if you want. And that's what Adorno would like you to do. But you remember I told you how the way to read him is to see what he, what is the problem, but also what is the problem with his writing. And this is how I would approach the question of what is the problem in this sentence. The question that becomes, two questions I have now. First, where are we, as the reader, are we behind the wheel? Are we the pedestrian, or are we somewhere outside? That's one question. The other question, which to me is even more important, is, is it possible at all to get out of this automobile? Is it all possible to be in a position when you don't experience the power of technology? Because, OK, fair enough, you driving this, this vehicle, this kind of 4x4 four four and Chelsea Tractor, and you are, you know, the king of the world. But can you ever get out of this car? Can you ever step out? Yeah, you can open the door and get, out, get out, of the, out of the car. But are you still not in the realm of the same technology? Are you not still empowered by the same devices? You know, don't you still feel, say, the military might of the country behind you? Or the industrial might, or the nuclear power or whatever, you know? Aren't you always in a position 
of technology as giving you some sense of power. So, so the question I would like to ask Adorno is, how do you get off? Can you get off? Because it is just possible that perhaps not only there is no getting off, but that you need technology in order to become human. And there is no other way to be human but through technology. You know, didn't we all learn in school that, you know, monkeys become people by learning how to use tools or something like that? Yeah? <coughs> so, okay, it's a stick or a bone or whatever, but it's still technology. So, isn't there a case to say that what Adorno says, this technology that makes you into a fascist, it's the same technology that makes you into a human? That's where suddenly it becomes much more complicated and also much more interesting. Because what is art? What is the Greek word for art? One of the Greek words for art is tech. So art is also a technology. Art is also a way of doing things. Yeah? So it's a skill. It's a, it's a sequence of gestures. It's a kind of repeatable sequence. Yeah? In art, there is always something that you learn how to do, and you keep doing, and you use tools, but there is a kind of um, there is an engagement that has something of technology about it. Yeah? So, it is just possible that for Adorno, perhaps you cannot get out of this uh, proverbial 4x4, uh, but you can use art to demonstrate its effects. Because in art, you might be able to show how these same mechanisms, these same movements can be used for a different effect. Yeah? So now I throw with a curved ball here. It's <coughs> we, we, we <laughs> went across many different fields um, just on the basis of this one sentence because I wanted to give you a kind of taste of um, how to deal with Adorno, and also how to spend time with him. You know, just as when you put an artwork in a gallery or in a book, you want the viewer to spend some time with it. I know from showing photographs to my students, <coughs> they don't see anything. They, I can show them, for instance, Jeff Wall. We look at it and say, well, well, what did you see? They didn't see anything. They don't know what they see. We need to talk about it for half an hour for the single still image to acquire any kind of meaning. You almost need to spell out every element in the image for it to become kind of available to the eye. But it's the same with text. You know, that's why we could spend quite a long time with, this, with just this one sentence and through that get a lot of what Adorno has to offer. Um, so, the whole minima moralia is, uh, is kind of like that, and, uh, and it's just, just full of this, uh, of these little gems, like, you know, uh, dialectical thought is an attempt to break through the coercion of logic by its own means. This is very adorable. You know, it is, you know, if you ever kind of, if you want to have an image of what dialectical thinking looks like, that is adorable. It is to overcome 
rationality by means of rationality is to uh, use force against force is the is to use logic and not some kind of hallucination to use logic to really show the limitations and the restrictions and the straitjacket of logic yeah so it's using language against language and of course ultimately it's using adorno against adorno and that brings us back to the flower petals and this whole story so uh, how are we doing for time uh, what time do you normally have a break is it about 6 30 what about six Well, past? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so, Adorno's key idea, if you want to sum it up for yourself in just one sentence, which is a scene, because philosophy is not for summing up. But, as a scene, I would say that the point he always returns to is that rationality is irrational. Now, if you get that as the leitmotiv, as the kind of leading line, you can unlock a lot of what Adorno says just through this simple notion. Rationality is irrational. And that is also the difference between Adorno and Hegel. Because for Hegel, rationality is rational. You can explain the whole world as a totality purely with the force of reason. So reason, for Hegel, is the ground, is the basic tool with which the world can be comprehended. Then Adorno comes and says, yes, that makes a lovely picture. But reason itself is unreasonable. However, we can only get to this unreason by force of reason. Yeah? So then you have this double bind. And it's, it becomes almost, that's why it's called negative dialectics. You know, because Hegel is dialectics. And Adorno says, well, yeah, but dialectics itself is not dialectical. At the very core, dialectics has a problem. It has a disease. And you need to use dialectics in order to open it up. That's why negative dialectics. Another reason why it is negative, think about the concentration camps. Think about the atomic bomb. For Hegel, in his blissful 19th century, um, perhaps there was still room to see thought and reason as a force for good, as a force that, you know, delivers the world to our feet and increases our wealth and, you know, makes us the, um, the race that uh, commands the seas and, you know, rules the waves and all of that. And you could still sing <laughs> songs of glory to reason. However, if you visit the 20th century with the destruction, with the second of the First World War, the Armageddon of the First World War, the genocides of the second, the nuclear bomb, the understanding that this very reason, with all its promise, is also now bringing us to a point when we can wipe the whole of human race with the press of a button, then dialectics itself, dialectics is reason, yeah, um, becomes negative. That's the negative. That's why the, the, the alternative cover has this dying flower. Go, go on uh, Amazon and look at it. <laughs> and, uh, so that's the, that's the two senses in, in which I understand the negative of the dialectics. So the question then is, for Adorno, how do you live a good life? So what does it mean? Because, so what, just to slash your wrists 
and die because you were not killed in the concentration camps because you are guilty for everyone who did die because you didn't manage to do anything, not with your writing, not with your life to, to prevent that from happening because it really does not make any sense because reason is unreasonable. So what do you do? So for Adorno, the task of his philosophy is to find the possibility of a good life. Which might sound strange given all these uh, stories I was telling you. But to find the possibility of a good life for Adorno means, do you know what it is? It's a three-letter word. Oh, art. Yeah. Art for Adorno is, if not the answer, then at least a possibility of hope. And in the seven minutes left before the break, I want to touch upon that a little bit. Why art? I mean, you need to bear in mind that before Adorno, or especially, I'm sorry, and I don't see when I see them. When, um, when Hegel was writing, uh, for him, art performed a certain function. But it was just one stage in the development of the spirit. Art, art had a function, but not more than that. For Adorno and for Kierkegaard before him, did you touch upon Kim Kierkegaard? But we'll talk about him later on in the second half of the session. Um, art is the key. Why? Because if, as we said, logic is broken, if dialectics itself brought us to this brink of complete annihilation and destruction and slavery and fascism, and you can call it any name you like, um, you know, um, any form of racism, any form of exploitation, all of that is kind of underpinned by reason and dialectics. Art offers a different form of logic. Art offers a kind of system where that is not based on the same rational logical premises. So that means the, the reason art offers hope is because through art you come to realize that there is another way. It might not be a perfect way, it might not be equally powerful, but reason is not the only game in town. The way I think about it sometimes is that, you know, if you think about a computer that can, or that, you know, runs, for instance, um, the DOS operating system, um, then it's only this system. That's Hegel, you know. In, in Hegel's mind, there is only one program you can run on the computer, and the program called Reason. There is only one piece of software. Now, Adorno comes and says, yeah, but look, on the same computer, we can also do something else. We can also play solitaire. We can also, you know, run other piece of software. And that allows for some sense of multidimensionality. And while it's not yet multiplicity, you will need Lyotard and Deleuze to get into multiplicity, and you will need Einstein and all the other things. It at least a kind of duality. At least it's not just one piece of software. You're not locked into this just one game of reason. So to be even more precise about on that point, For Adorno, the think about the, the kind of the very general term of representation. Adorno often called it reification. Did you come across reification? Reification is um,
reification. Res in Latin is a thing, thing. Reification is thingification. So what does it mean, thingification? Uh, when you <coughs> consider something as a thing, you know, um, when we say to objectify something, to treat them as an object, yeah? I have to confess that when I just uh, kind of learned English, I thought that to objectify means to treat someone objectively. So it really surprised me that the actual meaning is that you, you treat someone not as a human being, as an, but as an object. So reification is this state of mind when you consider living beings, complex processes, uh, like itself, as a collection of things. And just a little taste from uh, Negative Dialectics, <coughs> where Uh, so what we have here, the name of dialectics, can you see the, the second line from the The name of dialectics says no more to begin with than that objects do not go into their constants without leaving a remainder, that they come to contradict the traditional norm of adequacy. And a bit lower when it's underlined. Dialectics, again, indicates the untruth of identity. The fact that the concept does not exhaust the thing conceived. He says, concepts never fully explain reality. That was Hegel's main big idea, that his concept could fully explain reality. Yeah? And as we said earlier, the noise, the stutter, the rustling of the leaves, all of that, <coughs> the broken computer, these things don't fit within the system. And that's exactly what he's talking about. That <coughs> to resist reification, to resist objectification or representation, all, all these things basically mean that one thing can be fully substituted for, for another. You know, it means that you know, your passport photograph is essentially, for all purposes, you. That's your identity. You know, it stands in for you. It means that your, you know, a person can be represented by a number, but it also has obviously, you know, any kind of political implications that are, the main idea here is that finding a way to resist this notion of totality, that ideas can fully account for the world, yeah? The concept of, for instance, the concept of freedom that we can discuss here will never exhaust what it really means to be free. No matter how long we discuss it here, you know, it will never mean it. Yesterday, in the synod of the uh, Church of England, they've been debating for uh, 20 hours whether to allow uh, women to become bishops. Yeah? So, that's to do with 
objectification, treating someone as an object. Yeah? Uh, but also how no amount of discussion will ever match the thing itself. The thing itself is always bigger than the concept. Now, if dialectics, if logic, if reason cannot match reality, what can? <coughs> art can. Why? Because art, in a Dordo sense, real art, and we will get into that in a minute, um, real art does not imitate, it doesn't create copies, it does not represent, it doesn't work by objectification. Real art works on the basis of establishing similarity of when uh, the, uh, the word Adorno uses for it is mimesis. It's a word from, um, from, from the Greek, it can mean memory, <coughs> but it can also mean um, it means similarity. Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin has this short essay, very important, it's called The Doctrine of the Similar, in which he says that in the early days of humanity, human beings saw the world as similarities. So, you know, you look at the stars, and the shapes of the stars somehow mimic your own shape. That's kind of astro that's astrology before astronomy, when the shape of the stars has some direct connection to the shape of your own life. Yeah? So you look at the world, and you recognize yourself in the world. You see the world as, in some way, imitation, not imitation or um, a rehearsal or connection <coughs> to itself. It's very different, different from very different from representation and reification and objectification. When the world is presented to you as a frozen picture and you standing there as a kind of um, immobile observer collecting all these the world as photographs. Um, in mimesis, the main experience is the one of adequacy, or, or, or not adequacy, but um, some kind of echo or connection between you and the other, whether it is a person or a thing. You look, you look at the other and you see yourself in them. When you see yourself in them, you cannot treat them as an the object anymore because that becomes, you see that the other and you is essentially the same thing. Yeah? So if it sounds a little bit Zen, if it sounds a little bit Buddhist, it is. Um, because it is really trying to step out of the rationality of the Western philosophy and the basis of Western rationality, whether it is philosophy or science or literature or art, or architecture, or whatever you want, is that the observer is in the center, male, generally, looking at the world, receiving it as images, comprehending it with this huge intellect, you know, and producing um, objective impressions. That's science, that's art, and that's perspective, that's the telescope, that's what he is arguing against. Now, then the question is, what kind of art can have this mimetic power? It will not be art that imitates. Something else is required, something else entirely, more to do <coughs> with leaving room for disorder, for confusion, 
for some kind of little bit of anarchy or chaos. So, for instance, for Adorno, um, art that wants to be political by, for instance, showing inequality or showing exploitation or maybe, you know, um, you know, it's just not going to work because it's still a representation. You're still reifying something. And even if you have the best intentions, if you're going to show, let's say, the fat capitalist and the poor starving child or the uh, laborer, you know, uh, in chains, that is still reifying reality. For Adorno, art becomes politically valuable and it becomes a political agent when it just captures the possibility of something which is not rational. So for instance, uh, modernist music like Schoenberg was very important for Adorno uh, because it is autonomous, because it's not working on harmonies and scales. <coughs> yeah? it's, you never know from one sound to the next where it's going to take you. Or, for instance, uh, Kafka stories were very important for Adorno. Because in Kafka, there is no explanation to what's happening. It's just very, very strange. And that's how he lives. There is no key. If there was a key, it wouldn't be mimetic art. It would be, again, representation. So I think now we are coming to a point where we take a break, and when you come, when you come back, we'll uh, talk about uh, the, uh, the essay, which will basically we will continue doing the same thing, but we'll focus on the question. Right? So I don't know, what, what, what is your, uh, how long is the break? Hopefully someone will have one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah,
It really will apply. It's just been correct again. Yeah. It's been trying to make screens. But it's fine with me. Because for me, it was going on about using that space as well. We thought that was kind of cheap. There's another one. Well, that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm worried about most of is after Christmas we put all our work up. I don't think we have to fit it in any way, but um, as long as I can book a spice, that works no, it's not until. So. You see, it's a good question. For him, Hegel is not. For him, Hegel is the greatest philosopher who ever lived. Because Hegel came up with, it, with the best possible system. He explained everything based on him. But for Adorno, what are the only things that Adorno can do? Hegel against Hegel. Yeah, you're right about reason, but even if you say reason, I can see how your reasoning is not enough because there is something that does not fit in. Something that today we will say, you know, well, what about love, emotions, desires? How, how that fits, let's say, with physics and physics? So, what, you know, I don't know if he sees Hegel as an enemy. No, he, he is a Hegelian in a sense, but he is a, he is a Hegelian for whom Hegel offered a very powerful direction, but also problems. So, you know, he is. Well, he's extending, he's extending Hegel and he's also digging a hole I mean, through so Hegel, not, not, but not all the way. That's yeah. why I think in the end, I don't think it's more, it kind of more, um, That's why he dies with the students, because it's so expensive, yeah. because he comes face to face with the point at which, um, and when I remember it, what he never managed to get out of is the question of suffering. For, for Adorno, and for Hegel, the subject is in the center. And then what people that came after Adorno, for instance, Lyotard, who is very influenced by Adorno, they wrote a wonderful essay called Adorno and Devil. You know it. Uh, so um, then he said, well, let's get rid of the subject. You know, who needs the subject? Uh, let's just put technology uh, the or let's just put, uh, you know, the now, the ease. Mm -hmm. Let's just mm -hmm. get rid of the whole notion of the what subject it, and, it, it, and the eve. Let's just say it's for cosmos, it's not needed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, but I don't want to put it all in the name of the world. And I think yeah. in yeah. this consultation with the students, he could see that they kind of went beyond the subject. And they went beyond the subject because of him. So that's why they did it. Yeah. So, um, you know, he has very clear philosophical enemy, and that is Heidegger. Martin Heidegger is his clear enemy. The irony is that when you read Heidegger, Heidegger and Lodge are quite similar on many levels. Heidegger is exactly right. Heidegger is really responding to Hegel, but Heidegger is really setting himself kind of outside the whole Hegelian tradition. Because he wants to really get out of the whole question of subject and object. So the whole move out of subjectivity really starts with Heidegger. Heidegger says there is no such thing as a human being, as an entity. You only become a human being when you use tools. You only, it's only in the process. So for Heidegger, the technology makes a human. Not humans make technology, but technology. So it's this kind of conflict that makes me while I'm not agreeing, you know, I'm making the coffee. Um, so for that reason, you know, the, the 21st century, the 20th century, are much more Heideggerian than Adorno. Adorno can't. Um, Adorno is very useful for art because um, he really gives you some clear criteria to say when something works as art or not. For him, if art can show you 
how rationality is irrational, it is good art. And for that reason, most art to see in galleries doesn't help. But sometimes, art can happen not at all in the gallery, in a fetish club, for instance. In a, um, you know, it, it, art doesn't need to be to the well, for instance, you know, um, well, again, I will just stay with the example of the, um, of, uh, let's say, Southern Mountain Beach, where pleasure and pain are not opposites, but pain can be pleasure. Now, for that, I think, well, I don't think I don't want to go to the finish line, but I would think that that's a kind of form that <coughs> suggests that the logic that separates pain and pleasure to make separate entities does work. And there is another way in which they combine. You know, I mean, we know it from life that sometimes surgery can be very painful. Yes, yes, we don't need to go to the doctor. Well, it's good for you. Now, this is an even done kind of logic that we generally try to keep separate. Because we have to try to keep things. So when art works for Adorno is for instance in James Joyce, when let's say the narrative of the leaves is not a linear narrative. So all this logic of morning, day, day, evening, language, it's all kind of discombobulated and broken apart and put together in this it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in the regimented logic of the way. So, so whatever art makes sense through not making sense or exposes the twisted logic of the reason, then he will say we are uh, Artist performing its function. And this quotation in your uh, essay question um, that um, uh, Thank you. 
you could also say that it's very broad because it's almost saying that there are many more ways to be human than the ones we, we experience. And many more ways to think. So, you know, it's not the, the causal way of thinking in which we have positions and consequences. Um, it's just one way. And Calvin says, well, I have chose that there are no, it's not, it's not like he's uh, suggesting that you can live your life based on this logic, but you can use this logic to critique the way of life, to seek to be smart, to expose us. And, you know, the, for me, the, the real being is dangerous, not noticing reification, not noticing your representation. When you look at the photograph, you say, this is my wife and my dog. Then you are in this dream world in which images are completely identical to objects. So, um, is everyone have, does everyone have questions? No? So, um, yes or no? Anybody wants that? Um, um, do, 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 just, 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 just pass it. Take if you can take all of these. Uh, I, 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 um, maybe, maybe I will need one for good measure. If I can have one. Okay. Right. So now let's have a look at the questions. We. So what's your name? Sonny. So, um, we just started uh, talking about the first question already, so um, we can uh, maybe have a look at that for a start. So, the first question, now, I also thought that if, if there is a little bit of time, what time do we finish? Quarter past eight? Oh, no. eight. Quarter to eight. Okay, yeah. So what? Okay, we have an hour. Uh, so I also wanted to, you tell me if you want me to know, to talk to you how to approach writing an essay. Because from my experience, you sort of assume that everyone knows how to write an essay. Uh, but uh, I think it's, um, for me, it, it, it would be quite useful to just discuss maybe the, the technique, the technology of writing an essay because they don't just come fully formed, you know? And um, so I have a way to use that kind of works for me. And um, we'll speak about it a little bit later. But anyway, um, so question one, the term degenerate art was consistently used by the Nazis to describe virtually all modernist art. In a textual encounter with Benjamin, Lukács, and Brecht, Adorno takes the position that, and this is here, was page 65 of uh, uh, aesthetic theory, second line from the top, art need not defend itself against the rebuke that it is degenerate. Art meets this rebuke by refusing to affirm the miserable course of the world as the iron law nature. Typical Adorno, again, this is succinct and absolutely solid. It's like wrought iron, no? Beautiful. And somehow I think, well, I don't, I don't read German, somehow I think this is a really strong translation. It's just so well stuck together. Art did not defend itself against the rebuke that it is degenerate. So, okay. So what, what does it mean? Let, let's, let's just finish the question. Um, and discuss drawing on three avenues of inquiry. One, the role of reason doubt in Kant, Descartes, Arendt, restaging the condition of what it is to be human. The role of dirty, sensuous, via transgression or disruption of limits. The political value of art, according to Adorno, 
you are welcome to develop your argument in the relation to the practice of a number of artists, including yourself, if you so wish. So, the political value of art, according to Adorno, we kind of touched upon a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, because we have so little time, I think we um, probably will not say about, more about it at the moment. <laughs> now, in terms of Benjamin, Lucas, Lukacs, and Brecht, what the way I understand that is that Johnny wants you to have a look at a book that is called uh, Aesthetics and Politics. I think it's uh, Virago published, but I can go online now and check. Um, it's called Aesthetics and Politics, and it is an exchange of letters between Adorno, Lukacs, Brecht, uh, Bloch, and Benjamin. Uh, it's a kind of easy book compared to the other ones you need to read. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a really good one to get hold of. It's also quite cheap paperback. So um, I think that might be one place to dip your, to dip your toes in. But I don't, I don't necessarily think you uh, need to read from cover to cover just to know that what is it about? During the mid 20th century, for the left leaning intellectuals, which means for the intellectuals, there is a question how do you resist fascism? How do you resist the rise of the Nazis? And all these people we mentioned in different ways try to tackle this problem. Now, we don't have the time to go into the subtleties of their arguments, and they are fascinating, particularly the, uh, the discussion between Adorno and Benjamin is wonderful and definitely worth your attention. But basically, the question is how art can, what role art can play in this resistance? That's why the book is called Aesthetics of and, and people approach it in different ways. And, uh, and you need to be able to first state that this is actually the question. The question is, in what way art can be a weapon in the, the fight or in the resistance to the Nazis or to fascism? And so that's, that's one aspect of it. The other is <coughs> this question of the degenerate art. Now, you can just go online. Even the Wikipedia has quite a good article on degenerate art. Um, during the early years of the Nazi regime, when it was still quite concerned with the way the world views Nazi Germany, um, the Nazis confiscated a lot of modern artwork, mostly from the rich uh, Jewish household. And then they staged this exhibition of uh, what they call degenerate art to show how wicked, ugly, and cosmopolitan, in the negative sense of the word, the way the Nazis used it, this art is. How, you know, and they should look, look at this kind of. Uh, portraits, uh, paintings by Kandinsky and Malevich, and all these, you know, great modernists. How you know unnatural and ugly and degenerate they all are. So they hang them in a kind of crooked way, and um, and that was kind of the very famous. Um, that, that's where the very famous term degenerate art comes from. Then they sold them, them in auctions, and uh, the whole story of that degenerate art movement. Is very uh, is very interesting, but that's just by the by to explain the meaning of the term. I'm not even sure that Adorno using it in that meaning, in in, in re with reference to the Nazis here. But he wants to say that when people come and say, as we just said with Simon earlier, oh my four year old could draw could draw that, or this is just you know really stupid. It doesn't make any sense, and you know. If you go to 
contemporary galleries, if you go, let's say, to the Tate Modern in London and in, in the Turbine Hall, there will be like a very long crack in the concrete that runs throughout the floor, and that is the artwork. I mean, come on, you know, seriously, what, what is it about? Um, so when people come and say something like that, or like today in The Guardian, um, there was a photograph of a, um, someone who was photographing um, therapy rooms, a, a red sofa bed from a therapy room. And you can imagine the kind of all the comments, like, oh my god, they call it art, and why are we wasting our money on this kind of art education? You know, this is all very relevant. It's all about our own futures and lives. You know, people say, you know, this is just complete waste of time and you know doesn't doesn't require any talent. Adorno says against this rebuke <coughs> that this art is stupid, degenerate, imbecile, infantile, idiotic, taking the pace, you know. The only answer to that is that yes, it is imbecile, degenerate, because it's a degenerate world we live in. So this stupid, nasty, senseless art that you so condemn is an accurate reflection of the world you yourself created and inhabited. However, you do not see the stupidity, the narrow-mindedness, the nastiness of it, because you are in this inverted world, because your consciousness is so identified, is so reified, you're so unable to see yourself in the world, you so, you so see yourself as separate, as isolated from the world, that you do not even notice how wretched it is. All you need to do is just scratch the surface, you know, tiny bit, you know, take something out like that, you know, one of these immaculate objects that we are so desired, and just ask, how did it come into you? <coughs> Who made it? How much they were paid? Where do they live? Where do they go to the toilet? Where do they wash the hands? You know, why this thing doesn't come with a picture of the person who made it saying, hello, hope you enjoy my phone. Um, so you just need to scratch the surface to see how degenerate the world is. Because all these coveted objects are screaming to us about inequality, exploitation, abuse, child labor, you name it. Whatever you want, it's all there. Yeah? So don't come to me and say that this crack in the floor is stupid. Because it's your world that is stupid and the crack only shows it to you like a craft mirror. Yeah? That's what Adorno wants you to think. That also explains why art is such a key for Adorno. Um, so, you know, one example <coughs> of art that can engage you with this realization is this other people say my, my four-year-old could do it, you know? And so think about um, John Cage, 433, you know, the silent piece. Think about Malevich, the black square. What are these things about? They are about nothing. They are about emptiness. They are about the looking into looking the listening of the listening, it is the gender, you know, it is kind of imbecile, and yet it is somehow putting the finger on the pulse in a kind of way. It's sort of saying, well, you know, something is missing, you know, there is no key, there is no sense. So that's the story of this first question. Now, the three avenues Johnny suggests um, in terms of the role of reason and doubt in Kant, Descartes, Arendt. Arendt 
have a look at the human condition. It's a great book. Um, and um, well, basically, you know, and now I'm now I'm, I'm making a little detour to talk to you about how to write an essay. Whenever you write an essay, you need to tell a story for your own sanity and also for the sanity of the people who are going to read. There has to be a story. Now, there are many ways to tell a story, but the way I think generally works is <coughs> beginning, middle, and end. That seems to work. So, you need to have, have a beginning, middle, and end framework for your story. And we could sketch a, a kind of um, <coughs> you brought, uh, there was a tissue here, great, there was a little one tissue or something. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 I found it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> the, the beginning, middle, and end, you could, uh, start from is something like or you could say technology <coughs> or you just tilt the lens a little bit Sorry? Just tilt the lens a little bit. Oh. Above the top bit. The lens on the thing, you put the back, the top part. That the camera. sticking up, the camera bit. Sorry? That bit up top, yeah, if you put it back. Like this? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, so here is a nice little story for you to tell. God reason, art. And I think Johnny probably, in a much more eloquent way, uh, gave you this kind of framework in the past. In the beginning, there was only one way to know something. And that was revelation. That was some kind of spiritual connection. Uh, you know things because they are in the Bible. You know things because your parents told you. Okay. This form of knowledge is also a very has a very particular relationship to time. Because for instance, you know how in the Bible people live five hundred years and Abraham lived uh, nine hundred and eighty years. You know, time kind of stands still and nothing ever changes until everything changes, until suddenly you have Jesus. And then you, need, you have the New Testament. And then you will have the second coming. And then you will have Armageddon. And then you will have sort of, you know, apocalypse. So things remain the same, very, very static. And then bam, completely different epoch. That's a very religious form of time and very religious form of knowledge. When knowledge is coming from outside, why do we know things? Why there is good and bad? Because it says in the Bible, because there is the Garden of Eden and all that. Yeah? I'm being very uh, frivolous with that at the moment. But you you know what I'm talking about? Can you do it? Yeah. Okay. Now, then around, let's say, 17th century, things start to change. People invent the telescope and they look at the moons and the stars. People invent the microscope and look at the dirt under the fingernails and discover animals there. And um, other people discover politics. And people like Kant ask, well, how, we can, how can we get out of these dark ages, out of, this, out of the church, out of the godfather? So there is reason. Reason is very powerful, so we have science. We have a very different form of knowledge, when the human being, the subject, can know things by himself, not herself, yeah, by himself, because 
He doesn't need God anymore. He can take a picture of the world, process it in the head, and make a painting out of it, or a formula out of it. So that's the world of science, that's the world of the enlightenment, the renaissance, <clears throat> if you want. That's how democracy comes to the world, because when the subject is independent of God, and autonomous, and reasonable, he can be entitled with the right to vote, because he is reasonable, he can make reasonable choices. As a reasonable person, you can make reasonable decisions, you are allowed to go and vote for uh, women bishops or something like that, or for the, the police commissioners or other important things. So that's reason, yeah? And that goes like this until this, uh, yeah, and also the, the age of reason <coughs> has a different relation to time because the clock is being invented. Tick tac, tick tac, chronological time that can be measured, yeah? In the biblical time, there is, time is not measured in that way. Time is just one divine, godlike time. <coughs> so the age of enlightenment is the age of chronology. Everything is becoming measured, breaking into little bits. So first you have a clock with just one hand, just shows hours. Then you have two hands, it shows minutes as well, and it shows seconds and nanoseconds. You can break things into smaller and smaller uh, uh, units and measure them all and collect data about them and accumulate a huge amount of data. <coughs> and you have so much data that you can build a nuclear web bomb and you can do it in concentration camps and just talk about it. Yeah? Okay, so then comes time when something new comes, a new kid on the block. And you can call it what you like. <coughs> you can call it art in the sense of postmodern, modernist art like Malevich or uh, John Cage. You can call it technology. You can call it new media, the network, the internet, and we didn't get into that at all. But if that's your thing, then that's what you call it. And that way, it simply means a kind of way out of reason into something else. No back to God, that's impossible. But there is something to be rescued out of this God moment. In this God moment, when there was the father figure and you know you were subordinated, it was quite awful and very dark ages, but there was a kind of intuition, there was a sense of trembling. You know, you could have a kind of direct connection to something. You could just feel things and know that something is right, like Abraham in Kierkegaard, because you just feel that he's right. Now, in the age of reason, there is no feeling. I mean, what do you mean feel? Prove it to me. Quantify it. Measure it. You cannot measure this kind of ecstatic sense of it just right, it just must do it. So, here in the third part of the story, some of this intuition, some of this immediacy is brought back and somehow meshed with technology. This is a good story to tell for um, many purposes. And it also allows you to, for instance, speaking about the degenerate art, to say, well, art here appears as a resolution of a problem set up by reason. Yeah? And now, generally, a good way to start an essay is just to write it down as one sentence. So, Gen generally, you can formulate, you can write your essay in one sentence, which will go like something, well, for Rodolfo Adorno, art uh, allows to solve a problem created by reason. For instance, it's a bad sentence, but it will do for now. Fine. Now you have this one sentence. You can break it, you can then write three sentences based on this one, according to beginning, middle, end. This one sentence is packing, it, it packed quite a lot of punch because it, it really contains a lot of things. Okay, so to unpack it, you will say, okay, so the question of reason was set up by Hegel who wanted to explain everything and did this, this just one thing. Then Adorno comes and blah, blah, blah. So then each one of these sentences can be again broken into beginning, middle, end. If you just work it that way, 
you will have what we call an outline of your essay. So if you just persevere, and it, the best thing to do is to sit with someone else and just to brainstorm your question and then their question. And it's difficult to do it on your own, but if someone keeps asking you, say, so what do you mean by reason? Then you say three things about it, and they become your three points. And, and as the, moment, the more you build it, at some point you realize that actually you have the whole skeleton of your essay. And the good thing about it is that you never need to sit in, in front of an empty page and think, well, where do I start? Because you just need to then write paragraphs for each one of these so, of, of this, um, items. You can write your PhD thesis like this. You can write a book like this. You can write also a press release or an artist statement like this. And you can always show it to someone. Let's say if you, Johnny said very helpfully uh, there that you can go and ask her questions <coughs> with your draft. If you bring an outline like that, it's very easy, and I'm saying that some, because I, I supervise a lot of dissertations, and a dissertation mostly. If someone brings you an outline like this, it's very easy to look at it and say, well, why, why, why don't you move this part to the top? And maybe you need to have another branch or something like that. Because it makes sense. You can just see how the whole structure will develop. So it makes sense to build this kind of outline just breaking down one sentence into three, then each sentence again into three, then each sentence into three, you know, depending on the length of the thing you, you need to write. Every paragraph is about 200 words, yeah? So if you divide 3,000 3, word essay, divide it by 200, so you need about, about 15 paragraphs. So very quickly you see that you you have your, 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 your schema. Once you have 15 headings, that's it. I mean, there's no there's no room to write anymore. Sounds simple. No, it isn't simple. <laughs> but it does give you some kind of sense of purpose. And because I used to spend just weeks staring at a blank sheet of paper, you know? And um, and with that, you you don't need to, to face that. Let's move on to the next question. Um, are there any, any questions about the first question? No, we move on? OK, so question number two. Um, so what's the name? Rita. Tamrita. Tamrita. Uh, you said that you want to do a second question. Yeah? Do you mind reading it aloud? Yeah. I'm starting to lose my voice. Sorry. Okay. Slowly and loudly, please. Okay. Kierkegaard relinquishes the role of death, murder, commitment to a particular type of faith that requires a teleo teleological suspension of the ethical. The reader amplifies his mood by suggesting that it presents a gift. Analytically assessed, relying on their arguments, bonus, review, the tale, story of the eye, visions of excess, and your own heart. <coughs> Excellent. Now, Johnny asked me to communicate to you that bonus means bonus. You will get extra points. <laughs> Uh, we did not discuss how many, but I guess a few. Uh, okay, so what, what is that about? What is the suspension of the ethic? So what Abraham did when he was deciding whether to, when he lied to Sarah. So lied to Sarah about what? About him sacrificing Isaac. Mm. So it's, what was it about the lying? Is, is the lying the well, suspension of anything? It's coming against what his beliefs. Right. What is the ethical? What is ethical? The general moral. Sorry? The general moral that exists. Yeah, the morals. Yes. Yeah. So what does it mean to suspend the ethical? To go outside the what will happen if we will suspend the ethical in this class now? That's the final. It's, um, own, it's like a conscious. It's although. Do you remember in the in fear and trembling? And I hope you're reading the Penguin edition because the translation is so much better. Um, do you remember in fear and trembling? He talks about the the night of faith. And he compares the knight of faith with the tragic hero. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Now, the tragic hero is a character we kind of recognize from Hollywood films. 
he walks with his head high. A tragic hero is someone who, for instance, um, you know, a date comes down to you and says, uh, you know, uh, you are uh, in the battlefield, you know, unless you sacrifice your firstborn, you know, this battle will be lost. And then the tragic hero has this moral dilemma, if I sacrifice my firstborn, I'm going to lose the battle. And somehow, he always chooses to sacrifice and win the battle. Never the other way. And, and then he made this huge personal sacrifice for the sake of the city, of the people, of the nation. And he can walk with his head high because he did the right thing. And everyone can recognize that he did the right thing, even though we know in our hearts of hearts that we wouldn't have, perhaps, the courage to do the same thing. But we all know that he did the right thing, you know? So it's a bigger than life figure. You know, it's a hero. Kierkegaard says oh, he really does not care for that. For him, this is still following the general logic. The general logic says, yes, the, the good of the city is more important than your personal good, more important than your kittens or your children or whatever. So the hero follows the general logic. It's just more logical, if you like, than the rest of us. That, for Kierkegaard, is not fate. This is rational. Yeah? If you are promised to go to heaven for doing something and you do it, this is not fate. This is just simply reason. Yeah? So, do you notice how we actually go back to the same question of how reason is itself, has its own limits? It's interesting that the first book Kier um, Adorno published was on Kierkegaard. Because it's, it's, this, this problem of going beyond reason is crucial for him as well. Now, and who is the knight of faith? The knight of faith doesn't walk the streets with his head high. He sits somewhere in the cafe with his cappuccino, with his croissant, you know, he is just, you know, the, the smallest of men. Uh, he is not making any great grand gestures. He has these moves. He talks about the lack of faith. He has moves. The lack of faith is someone who, as, as Kierkegaard uh, describes, based on his own experience, sees this woman walking into the cafe and realizes that his life now changed forever and he will, you know, follow her and uh, be devoted to her even though he knows that's going to be his ruin and his demise. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense and no one understands it and it is completely, utterly stupid, as stupid as this crack in the wall that we spoke about earlier. It is nonsensical. It is like hearing voices. Yeah? Now, hearing voices is a sign of a madman. It is a pathology. That's what we're talking about. That's the night of faith. Well, that's what is at stake if you want to break out of rationality. And here, don't, don't think about rationality as something which is kind of opposed to religion. Because Kierkegaard says, if you want to see what, what rationality is really like, go to the church, go to the synod where they vote about women bishops. There you see rationality at work. That's not faith. That may be religion, but that's not faith. Faith is Abraham. Because Abraham is, while on the face of it, he is sacrificing his firstborn like a tragic hero. He is not doing it following the logic of the, of the tragic hero. He is doing it for a completely different reason, for a, for a no reason, for a voice in his head. Yeah? And a voice of whom? Is it the, when Johnny was teaching us this text, she made us read all of it, replacing uh, God with art. 
We should do it with you. But, but you should try it. Just try to read this, uh, the problemata. Um, and then you realize Abraham is an artist. He's someone who feels compulsion to do something. Why? There is no reason. It's just a compulsion. You know, why you are here studying philosophy? It's sort of thing, you know. It just happens. It it drags you along. It carries you along along a kind of strange path. You don't know where it goes. Um, I often tell my students when they come to ask me, uh, what shall I do for my project? I tell them that, you know, if you wanted to tell me what to do, you will never get more than a 2-2 two -two as a mark. Because a real project is not knowing what to do. It's leap into the unknown. It's taking a risk. Do you know um, the French artist Yves Klein? You know Yves Klein, yeah? He has this fantastic photograph. It's called Leap into, uh, Leap into the Void. When you see him jumping from a window ledge into the street. Now, he was a judo black belt, so perhaps he really knew how to jump and fall. But it's this leap into the void, this leap into the street. That's what you do as an artist. You don't know when you will land on your feet, when you will break your neck. But you just know that you need to do it. You know, now I'm not suggesting for a minute that you need to go and jump. But it's interesting that in the Saatchi Gallery, there is now an exhibition of Russian artists. And one of the photographers, a photographer there, has a series of Russians sitting on the ledge, on the, on the window ledge, kind of looking down. And you don't know if they are about to jump, or they just sit there for the hell of it, having a, a, a thrill, or they really just don't care. Because to live, or to live and to die is one thing, it's the same thing, and it doesn't make any difference anymore. This is just as a sign. So that is the suspension of the ethical. It's, a, it's an extreme thing. It puts you on a collision course with society, with common sense, with a pension plan, with anything you can imagine. Um, and what is the reward? The reward is that it might work out. It might work out, but you don't know whether it will or not. What you do know is that no one will kind of upload you on the streets. No one will take their hat for you. Because it's not a kind of heroic gesture anyone will recognize. Your family and your friends will tell you that you are probably mad. And you probably are. However, that may be what is required in order to break away from this prison of reason. <clears throat> so, as you rightly said, the, the gift is the gift of death. Yeah? So it also might be useful to look at uh, Freud on the death drive. And uh, I don't want to overload this question, but there is also an argument that Nietzsche puts forward, where he says, what is good for you? I mean, the thing that gives you the most power must also, might also be the thing that kills you. And those things which are good for prolonging your life and giving you, you know, longevity, they might actually weaken you terribly. And it could be that if you really want to have maximum power, you kind of need to live into the void, like uh, like Eve Klein. So there is a contradiction here between what is true and what is good. It just could be that truth is very bad for you and for me, for all of us. The truth is really, really dangerous. Well, it was clearly very dangerous for Isaac, <coughs> poor Isaac. And um, that's the kind of, the, that's the suspension of the ethical. It's the suspension of reason. It's the suspension of good and evil, of knowing what is right and wrong. It's getting out of all this 
it's getting into a place of not knowing. So that's, but it's also a place where art can actually happen. Because art doesn't happen as long as you structure it along the, uh, on the basis of what is good and bad, what is beautiful and what is ugly. Adorno already said that for us. And Kierkegaard probably was the first one to lay the foundations of it. Now, Kierkegaard, the way to understand him, and again, in terms of before, uh, beginning, middle, end, Kierkegaard is a response to Hegel, is a negative response to Hegel. Famously, um, Kierkegaard went to Berlin, and I think he even sat on some of uh, Hegel's lectures. Maybe it was not Hegel, but, but anyway, he, he, he studied all this idealism, and he hated it. And he said about Hegel, he said, he built Hegel, built a wonderful house, but no one can leave them. And that really gives you the sense of what Kierkegaard is about, because he wants to have some intuition, some immediate instinctive experience, not mediated by reason, not given through logic, not contaminated by this kind of shared knowledge, but something instant and immediate, and it is incredibly dangerous. But for many, many people who came after Kierkegaard, and especially, you know, for artists, Kierkegaard is really showing the way to non-mediated experience of life and the possibility of art that comes out <coughs> of an intuition, of a drive. Yeah. So we're talking here about a way to oppose reason. So um, that's, what, how, that's how I would structure this question. I would explain how reason comes into being, what is the problem of reason in terms of shared experience, in terms of just that it is so damn boring, and you cannot leave it, as the word says. And the solution is this night of faith. <coughs> and the night of faith, I mean, go and read it again. The night of faith, he has moves. He moves in mysterious ways. You know, he, he really connects with something uh, pre-social, pre-individual. You know, something before there was a sense of I, there was a sense of the ego, there was a sense of uh, the person that I am. There is something before that, you know. There was time when we were just a tribe, when we were running around naked, and we were not, you know, different people, you know. We were just part of a tribe. One person knew how to throw, how to shoot an arrow. So it was, it was a hand that shoots the arrow. It was a, a womb who makes children. It was, you know, a face who can crack skulls. And that was just one, one organism. The tribe was the organism. We were all part of it because we brought certain skills to the tribe. But we were not individuals. We didn't have our ID cards, we didn't have names. And it was a dangerous existence, because clearly, this hand that throws the stone doesn't mean much beyond the hand that throws the stone. So you can also very easily perish. But then the hand get, also gets branded with tattoos and marks, and these tattoos later become some kind of form of identity. That they become the first signs through which identity can be read. But at a very basic level, there is still this kind of, you know, entity that moves along and doing things, and you just belong to it by something that you bring forward, by something that you know how to do, by a technique, by a technology, by your art, yet yeah? not as an individual. So that's what Kierkegaard is talking about. I'm not suggesting you put all of that in. I was what I was talking about now is a drawing on um, an article by. Alfonso Lingis. Lingis. And the article is called The Society of Dismembered Body Parts. The Society of Dismembered Body Parts. So the title kind of explains it. It's very good. Short and sweet. Right, shall we move to the next one? Any questions about two? <coughs> Are we doing for time? Very good. Uh, are we good? Or are we running out of time? No, we still have time. Yeah?
Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about um, explaining um, the question, explaining how easy it was to be for the first part, and yeah. um, the last part, the solution, uh, yeah. the night of pain. And what was the middle part that you spoke about? Well, I don't know. Um, yeah. I'm not very sure. Um, um, what do you think? Sorry? Could you repeat the question? Oh, it was for the question number two, the Kierkegaard one, when you were talking about structure of the essay, and you said to split it into three sections, and for the first section you said to explain how reason comes into being, and then I missed the second part, and then you said for the last part you can perhaps talk about the night of faith as the solution. Well, I think maybe the middle part is the, um, the tragic hero. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can try that was it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, shall we move to the third question? Mm -hmm. uh, the third question is quite tough. It means um, it's a bit um, strong. What is the difference between objective and subjective once one leaves the methodology of dialectical reasoning? Why, or better, how does that matter? Please cite in your analysis section from Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, Marx, this is the core about and Foucault what is enlightening. Bonus. See if you can develop the way in which negation and or negativity works in both in both dialectical and discursive approaches. I will just I, I want to move to the fourth question. Uh, interesting. Uh, and I think we don't have much time. I will sketch a little bit uh, what do I think you can do with the third. Essentially, where where this notion of objective and subjective coming from? Again, remember our story, beginning, middle, end? On this scale of God, reason, art, where would you place objective, subjective? In the middle. In reason, that's right. Why? Because reason is the tool of the subject. How the subject knows the world? By representing it, by making pictures of it by using perspective, yeah? So for, for instance, uh, you know Brunelleschi's perspective. You know the very famous experiment when um, he takes the painting and then make, makes a hole in it and, and you look at the world through a tiny hole and you see the whole world unravel for you and you can draw beautiful paintings and they look almost like real life as long as you are immobile and you stand in the center. Yeah? Virtual reality, which did really take off in new media, but it's kind of the same idea. You still have this immobile subject in the center. Um, that's the subject. So the age of reason is the age of the subject. The world is the object. The world becomes an object, objectified, reified. You already spoke about all these things. The world, Martin Heidegger has a very famous text that's called The Age of the World Picture. It's in his book, Question Concerning Technology. And just useful to know, and I'm sure you will come across it. But there he puts forward this argument that in the modern era, the world becomes a picture. So it's not like we have pictures of the world. But the world itself becomes a picture. We experience the world as an image. You know, Susan Zontag, if you ever read Susan Zontag's book on photography, she starts from saying that we still live in Plato's cave. We still learn about the world from photographs that surround us and all. So it's the world that becomes a picture. Yeah? That's the basic experience of the subject. Yeah? Now, so if you're going to talk about uh, or subject and object, position them within this framework, say that the subject only comes into the scene when reason becomes the tool for knowing the world. Reason needs a subject. Subject needs reason. These two things, it's basically one thing. Yeah? Now, um, when you have a subject, then the object is everything which is not the subject. So again, if you want the Hegelian move, take the subject, take the object, put them together, and you have the whole world that comes around and gives meaning to the subject and the object. Yeah? 
So, uh, that, if you like, is the basis of the dialectical reasoning. And we're just following the question. Um, so, what happens when you leave that behind? Now, that, that's what happens with Adorno. Adorno wants to leave that behind. He wants to step out of dialectics. He wants to step out of subjectivity and objectivity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he never leaves the subject completely. He cannot go as far as Lyotard and Deleuze to say there is no subject. There are only desires. There are only flows. And flows create subjects. The, um, Adorno doesn't go that far. He stays with the subject, but the subject in Adorno is never separate from the object. The subject, and the, the subject has the object within it, and the object has the subject. And, and the relationship is all the time of doing and undoing. They, they kind of, they, they, um, it's almost like a sort of a, uh, what, would be, what, what would be a good image for that? Um, the subject is never separate from the object. The object is not outside the subject. It's this experience of they, they, they need each other constantly. Because in traditional, in Hegelian dialectics, dialectic, there is very clear separation. And the whole process of the Hegelian dialectic is for the spirit to recognize that it is the whole world. There is just the spirit. And once the spirit recognizes that, it acquires this full sense of truth of recognizing itself as being the truth, as being the whole world. There is nothing else. Everything I see here around me, it is just my own spirit. Once you, that, that, that's, that's the Hegelian move. But for Adorno, the, the subject and object are in this interlocked, never finished, never ending dance relationship. So it is about saying that the distinctions between subject and object break down once you step out of dialectics. Once you get into negative dialectics with Adorno, this, this, the, you don't have, you cannot have all the two as separate. Now, why and how does that matter? Well, it matters very much politically because Politically, if you separate the subject from the object, then the object is an object. So then you are an object to me. Yeah, and I am an object to you. And your partner is an object to you. Your children are an object to you. So that, that's why it matters. And, um, well, Hegel phenomenology already looked at. Marx, the thesis on Feuerbach, you just need to look at that. And I think you, you will find what to quote from that. And Foucault, what is enlightenment? That's a very short text by Foucault where he explains what is the main motivation of Kant. And as I said earlier, what Kant is trying to do is to get you out of the Middle Ages, is to get you out of the father figure, out of God. And how he does it? By, by, by giving reason, by giving you reason as a tool to move forward. However, Foucault will be quick to point out, there is a price to pay. I'm not going to get into that because there's, there's, there's probably too much for the next 15 minutes. But it's a short and very important text by Foucault that is uh, worth looking at. So that's this question. Uh, any questions about it? I'm just going to go back to what we said earlier, uh, sort of more uh, to the questions concerning technology. Yeah. Could be the author's name, Martin. To Sorry? The author's name. To the it's Heidegger, Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger. Heidegger, Question Concerning Technology. It's a little book, it's about eight pounds. Again, one of these things that will sustain you for a long time. And uh, it's, well, I'm sure you will kind of uh, be reading it in this class anyway. 
but this age of the world picture is uh, is very helpful, especially if you are interested in representation or in visuality. Well, representation is the thing I'm very interested in. So that becomes a really key text. It just changes the way you think about about the image. Can I just uh, ask on the yeah. question as well? Could you just say about the way negation works in Presumably, it's negative dialectics, so it's the Adorno on the dialectical mode. What about the discursive approach to that? What do you mean, discursive approach? Well, it's in the question, that's why. Uh, one Bonus, see if you can develop a way oh, in which negation oh, oh. works see in discursive. See if you can develop the way in which negation and or negativity work in both dialectical and discursive approach. Well, hmm. uh, well, with negation, you can say that the question is what is negation? for Adorno. And we didn't get into that very much today. Um, but it's the question of non-identity and negativity. Um, well, you remember what we said earlier about negative dialectics. Mm -hmm. Why dialectics have to be negative? Because you need to somehow, because reason brought its own destruction. So negative dialectics is dialectics that is aware of the Problem with dialectics. It's it's using dialectics to unpack the irrationality of reason. You remember when I said earlier that the, 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 the whole point of Adorno is to show that reason is irrational. Yeah? So it's always to show that dialectics is negative. That's that, that's the point. And you get that. In the, in the introduction to negative dialectics, precisely in this section that uh, I hope we will have uh, time to read through, dialectics not a standpoint. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's basically it, but we don't have a lot of time. I also have a train to catch to go back to London. I don't mind staying here a bit later, but. Uh, 830 will have to be on the platform. Um, so so uh, that, that's basically uh, the story with uh, with negation. It's, it's, to, it's to show what problem Adorno identifies in Hegelian dialectics. Why then he needs to call forward negative dialectics. For, for Adorno, you see, Hegelian negation is not real negation, because the negation of the negation always gives you a plus. It's like uh, minus and minus gives you plus. And he says, well, that's not good enough. You still end up with a totality. He wants a real negation. He wants, he, he says, there is always a remainder. There is always something that does not fit. You know, you can take a woman, you can take male and female, put them together, you have totality. But what about gay? What about transgender? What about, you know, a million other possibilities that you can be, you know, which is neither male nor female, or maybe both, maybe a bit of each. That doesn't fit. This, th that's what makes real, genuine negativity. Um, and this is a very interesting question, because it also gets into the whole idea of what if, for instance, um, the feminist argument is not, you know, how to have a, will, a woman on top instead of a man. That's not the point. The point is to say, what if men and women are really genuinely different? They are different. And because they are different, we need to accept the difference, not identity, is the key for understanding how things operate. So rather than saying, rather than starting your worldview from the point of view of identity, start from the point of view of difference. It's a, it means complete shift. People like Lucie Rigaret writes about it. She says, if you take feminism really seriously as a call not for giving women equal rights, but as a call for acknowledging the difference between men and women, then you need to Revisit your understanding of time, revisit your understanding of space, because even time and space we understand from the perspective of 
the single observer, male. But if you put a woman instead of the man, you still have a single observer. But if you put difference where a single observer used to be, you have a completely different worldview. Yeah? That's very, very radical. That means that the whole metaphysics that we kind of comfortably live within could be totally rejected if you put this difference at, at its core. And that's very key for postmodern philosophy. The theory Garay is very important for that. And, um, well, of course, of course uh, many other uh, people. But Deleuze is important for this move, because Deleuze is the one who brought difference to bear where Adorno has the negative or the non-identity. Deleuze kind of says non-identity is still not radical enough. What we need is not non-identity, but a pure undiluted difference. But that's, that's a kind of another story. I would love to go through it with you uh, someday. Finally, let's go to question four. On the question of writing poetry at Auschwitz, Adorno writes. And I think we need to open the page. And that is, I don't know why it's always ending with Auschwitz. But that's just the, that's the curse of these things. You always end up on, on the wars. So that is page 363. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. Three six two. So sorry. It's uh, right. So I think the reason I want you to see it, to see it because the quotation ends in a very Adorno unexpected way. Uh, I mean, expected for Adorno. So, but since. In a world whose law is universal, individual profit, the individual has nothing but this self that has become indifferent. The performance of the old familiar tendency is at the same time the most dreadful of things. There is no getting out of this, no more than out of the electrified barbed wire around the camps. Perennial suffering has as much right to expression as a tortured man has to scream. Hence, it may have been wrong to say that Dr. Auschwitz, you could no longer write poems. And now, the punchline. But it is not wrong to raise the less cultural question whether after Auschwitz you can go on living especially whether one who escaped by accident, one who by rights should have been killed, may go on living. So here you see the survivor's guilt. Adorno, you probably know that he's a uh, very close friend and ally. Walter Benjamin committed suicide uh, in the war. He did manage to get to the States, uh, and Adorno felt guilty about it because he Anyway, long story, it's an interesting story. But, uh, but this thing that he says, well, it, no, it is not wrong to write poetry after Auschwitz. However, it is wrong to live after Auschwitz. This is very, very adorable. So this whole question of uh, really comes out of the very famous sentence attributed to Adorno, where he says, that writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. So
So basically, after Auschwitz, there can be no more arms. However, here he says something else. He says, well, you cannot stop the tortured person from screaming. The tortured person, he says in his wonderful sarcasm, the tortured person has the right to scream. And so, there will be art after Auschwitz. Art after Auschwitz is the scream of torture. Again, think about this crack in the turbine hole, and it, and it kind of it starts to make sense. You know, does a scream make a lot of sense? What a scream means? If I scream now, which I won't, but if I scream now, what a scream means? What is the meaning of a scream? Can you go to the dictionary? and <coughs> check the meaning of a screen? No, a screen is just a screen, yeah? So you get shivers down your spine. So we feel that someone is in pain. Maybe having an orgasm, maybe giving birth, maybe, you know, I don't know, sleep on a banana peel, a screen. It doesn't mean anything, yeah? But it means something at the same time. So that's the kind of art Adorno is after. What the screen represents, it does not represent, it's just a screen. Do you understand? It's very important. That is, this is such a key point for Adorno and for everything else and for your <coughs> own art. You don't want to represent, you want to create the sense of presence that the screen creates. Yeah? And that's not to say that all art has to be some kind of macabre, because right? you know it can be a screen of joy. But <clears throat> here I think you get into this whole question of representation and how the kind of art that really for Adorno has no room, especially after Ocean is a representation art. Because how are you going to represent Auschwitz? How are you going to represent suffering? How are you going to represent genocide? Um, it's interesting. Um, I, do you know the memorial for the Holocaust in Berlin? Do you know? Does, unfortunately, there is nothing I can show you. but. <coughs> I, um, I always think about it to, understand, to explain to myself how representation operates. This, whole, this memorial um, to the Holocaust in Berlin um, is just a, it's a very large area in the public, kind of in, in, in center of town. And there are just slabs of concrete. They, they different sizes and different height. And there are rows and rows and rows of them. So it's almost like a, you can walk between them. But you would expect them to have sort of names, you know, like Baden-Baden, uh, Treblinka, you know. They don't have, they have no inscriptions, nothing. And it doesn't say anything. It just is absolutely smooth slabs. You can look at them and you can imagine them like rows of soldiers kind of coming up over the horizon or rows of people queuing in the camps to the showers or the gas chambers or obelisks for villages and towns that are no more, or just some kind of ruins of a civilization that was there and gone. You can imagine, but, but it doesn't say anything. Unlike, let's say, memorials that you see even in this uh, institution, the memorials that commemorate people who died, and it says that it doesn't say anything. So the, kind of, the only thing it says is that something is forgotten, something is erased, something is not written down. Yeah? And it kind of it, it makes sense because, well, and what if you had all the names of all the six million people who died? And what if you wrote them on all these slabs, you know? Let's say you cover them with names. Would it be a memory? No, that would be forgetting. Because writing it down is forgetting. It's putting something to one side. Someone once said, once said that uh, a Holocaust memorial 
has to be built out of paper. So it will be all the time breaking down and disintegrating. So you will be all the time having to repair it and, and keep it, you know, by sticking pieces of paper to it. And that, that will be a way of never letting it sleep. Because once you write something in stone or marble and stick something on a pedestal, you can't put it out of your mind. While that, what this memorial trying to do is to say the only thing it says is that something was forgotten. We don't know what. We just know something. It's almost like you stumble into these ruins of a civilization that disappeared from the earth, from the face of the earth. You don't know what civilization it was. You don't know what language they spoke. What was their name? You don't know anything. The only thing you know is that there was something there, and now it's gone. And we just know that something is forgotten. But this knowledge in itself is invaluable. And it is in itself unrepresentable. This <coughs> knowledge of something that was forgotten cannot be represented. You cannot make a picture of it. You can only kind of experience. So it's like a screen <coughs> that I spoke about earlier. So for me, the question of writing poetry after Auschwitz is, is to get into the whole question of how uh, art has to be non-representation. So the art that Adorno says that after Auschwitz uh, cannot really happen is representation. And the scream is the alternative, is the mimetic art. In mimetic art, Art does not represent, but you recognize something, you know. And it's this recognition when you when you hear someone scream. There is something that makes you realize that it is also part of you, to some extent. It's not just over there. Um, so what does it mean politically, philosophically, and aesthetically to suggest? Not only can one write poetry after Auschwitz, but also that one must write poetry after Auschwitz. So the question is not only whether one must write or not, but also what kind of poetry. Yeah? And that's where, as I said, you remember I said in the beginning, the reason I think Adorno is so useful, you can really use him in discussions about art, whether something is art or not, whether something works or not. It's not a matter of opinion. Tell like, it, oh, but I really like this poem. You have a criterion. You have a kind of tool. If it is a screen, if it is mimetic, it works. Because it, it suggests, it argues that there is some irrationality. There is irrational scar on the face of rationality that's not going to heal the crack the terminology of all comes to mind yet again. Um, but if it is representational, if it is uh, Schindler's List, yeah, then it is not art, because it is another form of representation, another form of some kind of system. I'm not saying that it is, it is necessarily a fascist system, but a system. So here you have a kind of interesting distinction between representational art and mimetic art, between reification and mimesis. And I think that will be a good place to draw it to a close. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Sorry? Thank you. Oh, sorry, there was, there was another question. I apologize. Question five. Um, how many people are interested in that question? <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> it is tough, and then you need to read Einstein. <laughs> That's why I was kind of not... Um, but also, I think Johnny will be much more qualified than me uh, to help with that. Um, so, that's why I thought maybe it's, it's okay.
Yeah. So that's it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't need to go. Yeah. If, if you have any questions, I'm happy to stick around and uh, and chat about things. But thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.